Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome. I'm Sandy Quinn, president of the Richard Nixon Foundation, and we're delighted to have you here at the Richard Nixon Presidential Library and Museum in Yorba Linda, California, and we, I say welcome to our global television audience as well. As you know, those of you who come with any uh, frequency, we uh, pride ourselves on having distinguished speakers, uh, disting distinguished authors, and we've done a pretty good job of it uh, over the years, and as uh, President Nixon um, himself asked, let this podium be bipartisan, let it be uh, open to different ideas and, and uh, not necessarily people who agree with, with us. And just in the last month, we've been pretty good on bipartisan things. We had um, Linda Johnson Robb, the daughter of President and Mrs. Johnson, here for a day. In fact, it was on Pat Nixon's birthday just a couple of weeks ago, and she laid flowers on, on, uh, on her grave on that day. And today, of course, we have Lanny Davis. But before I introduce him, I want to take advantage of our audience to mention a couple of upcoming events because I know you like to come back. And if, you'll, if you're members, you'll get a discount at these and, and other things that we do. Now, May 24th is the 40th anniversary of the Vietnam POWs coming home to America. And we're celebrating that by inviting the POWs, uh, now uh, numbering over 200, uh, those who can travel are coming. And we're doing the 40th anniversary on May 23rd and 24th. This is a celebration of their homecoming. And I think these fellows are great American patriots, and we're going to be honored to, to uh, have them here and to celebrate. On May 20th, we have Secretary of Defense twice, uh, Don Rumsfeld, and he will be here for a book signing and lecture. His new book is uh, Rumsfeld's Rules. It comes out on May 14th, and part of his national tour includes a stop here on May 20th for the West Coast launch of that book. And he goes through all kinds of rules, as does author Davis in the first chapter of, of his book. But they're fascinating. They're, they apply not only to uh, government, to, but to everyday life and to business. So please um, visit our gift shop or online uh, to get tickets for that. On June 11th, we have astronaut Buzz Aldrin, the second man on the moon. And he will be here for a public lecture talking about his book, Mission to Mars. And he, of course, is a great American, a great global statesman because of, of his uh, uh, distinguished uh, uh, little visit to, visit to the moon. So you might want to visit uh, him on that day. Rich Lowry will be here on June 18th. Uh, and he is a distinguished political commentator. And I think he would be great um, uh, to hear as well. Those of you who have children or grandchildren, please come during the summer to our free Meet the Presidents, where your youngsters and you can meet President Washington, President Jefferson, President Truman, uh, President Nixon, as portrayed by his brother, uh, Pat Nixon, and Teddy Roosevelt. And these are uh, 10.30 in the morning. Uh, the schedule is uh, is on our on our um, uh, website, which is uh, www.nixonfoundation.org. Now I have to tell you that George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Harry Truman, Teddy Ro those are not the real presidents. <laughs> no, I have to tell you because we have a distinguished lawyer tonight, and it's the kind of thing that. You know, they make a big deal about it. You misrepresented that. My kids were so disappointed. It was not really George Washington who spoke that time. So I'm just, I'm being cautious. I'm being careful. Now, uh, tonight we don't have a president, but we have a close advisor to one, uh, one who uh, was not only a White House lawyer, uh, he's been a distinguished corporate, public, private, and public sector 
a lawyer uh, in Washington uh, for years, a true Washington insider, as close to the Clintons as anyone that I've ever met, other than the Clintons who were here for President Nixon's uh, services. Um, and he's a crisis manager, he's a TV commentator, uh, and, and he's an author. And we're delighted to have him uh, because I love seeing him on television. He has a way when he's, <laughs> when asked a question, when he wants to, wants to nail somebody, it's so gentle. You, <laughs> you never know even that it's going into your back. You never know it. You, n <laughs> you never see any blood. You just, and he smiles the whole time. And you think, you know, he's right. I never liked that guy. <laughs> Absolutely. Why didn't I think of that? <laughs> so he's going he's gonna to team up with Ann Coulter. They're going to have a great show on Fox. No, he's not. No, he's not. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, the author of Crisis Tales, which will be uh, available in our gift shop, and I hope you will visit that immediately after, because he will be in the lobby signing. And right after his lecture, we're going to ask you if you'd like to pose questions to him. It's my honor to present Lanny Davis. Well, thank you for that introduction. I know that uh, I have two older children and six grandchildren and two younger sons, 14 and eight, and the four children and the six grandchildren, my certainly two oldest children and my wonderful wife of 28 years, second wife, do the math, <laughs> have heard me described as even keel, smiling when Hannity is yelling at me, <laughs> never losing control, everything smiling. And after I get those sorts of introductions, I am looking out at an audience sometimes where any one of my children or my wife is sitting and all I see is rolling eyes. <laughs> Who are they talking about? <laughs> so thank you for noting my good humor when I am on some of these television shows. And I do want to speak to uh, a, a serious issue about that. But part of the good humor comes from what's my alternative? <laughs> <laughs> when you're enduring. Uh, people shouting over you and interrupting you. It is theater uh, to some extent. I have respect for uh, Sean Hannity. He's actually a really nice man. Bill O'Reilly treats me always with respect. I have my dialectic among the guests. I am a uh, Fox News contributor. I'm a partner of Michael Steele, who is a Republican conservative and member of the MSNBC uh, team. So I'm Fox liberal, he's MSNBC conservative. There's something wrong with this picture. <laughs> but that's not a bad segue for me to talk a little bit serious about the topic at hand. And that is uh, our culture of political polarization in America, where we substitute for political dialogue in many, many conversations that occur here that are not conversations, they are food fights. And there isn't debate, there is attack. And there isn't the ability to discern what is really important in a debate or in viewing history, but there is more of vitriol as a surrogate for civil discourse. So let me first address President Richard Nixon and how moved I am to be here and to learn in 45 minutes to an hour of walking through, especially the new exhibit, what a remarkable life this great man led. And I'm a liberal Democrat raised in a household where the name Richard Nixon wasn't a popular name with my father. And I was not a neutral observer 
when in the 1960s, I supported Senator Humphrey, then Vice President Humphrey, in the 1968 presidential election. So you're not looking at a neutral. I was and am a liberal Democrat. And we all know that every great man in human history, truly great man, has flaws and weaknesses and makes mistakes. But I know how moved I was and I am in the life of Richard Nixon, the greatness of Richard Nixon, and especially the presidency of Richard Nixon that I was reminded of just a little bit more when I walked through this museum. So my one anecdote is to my remarkable surprise, on one occasion, President Bill Clinton and I were talking politics, very unusual topic for <laughs> President Clinton, and we were talking presidential history, and he said something that surprised me, because I didn't know. And he said, do you know who I turn to for advice, for wisdom? And this is before the big blow up that occurred, the tragic mistake of uh, Bill Clinton. I said, who, Mr. President? He said, Richard Nixon. I said, wow. And then I listened, words that then became uh, much more moving and in the sad occasion of the passing of Richard Nixon when President Clinton gave that eulogy that brought tears to my eyes and to most Americans because in that eulogy or in those comments, Bill Clinton reminded us that we all transcend these moments of division, partisanship, sometimes even the H word, which in my house, my boys are not allowed to say, but I'll mention the word here, which is the hate word. And in the 60s, the hate word was used by a lot of people, including me, about people who disagreed. Uh, and through the 70s and the 80s and the 90s, it became a very common word. I hoped after the bloodletting that occurred in the Clinton years that we'd be over that. And a very good friend of mine who I was in college with, it seems like between Yale Law School and Yale College, there was something in the New Haven drinking water. I'm like the Forrest Gump of my generation. <laughs> One of my close friends in Yale College, before I went to Yale Law School and met someone named Hillary Rodham, when that was her last name before she met someone with a different name, I was close friends with somebody named George Bush, who I voted for for president, not of the United States, of my fraternity. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll come back to this theme, but I will tell you that I knew not one person. My wife says a redundancy are two words that are redundant. So when I say at Yale, there are a lot of men who had egos, the women in the room tonight will say, that's a redundancy. <laughs> so in a world of Yale College, all male, when I was there in the 60s, and all these egos, I knew not one person who had a bad thing to say about George Bush. And the likability, the character, and the good-heartedness of this man, I did not vote for him for president on either occasion. And I opposed, I would say, a majority of his policy positions. But as to good heart and character and strength, there is a man that I would uh, rely on when I'm in a crisis. Richard Nixon devoted his life to public service. And as we say in the world of politics, you can do a Nixon to China moment. That's a proper noun. It's more than about Richard Nixon. It's about what John Kennedy wrote in Profiles in Courage. It's standing up to your base to make them larger than their narrowness. And he did that when he went to China. A liberal Democrat probably couldn't have gotten away with it because it would have been seen as a left versus right moment. He transcended those terms and brought us the 10 days that changed history, as I 
was told a little while ago, Secretary of State Clinton commented about that moment in world history. I was also reminded that a conservative Republican president, Richard Nixon, created the Environmental Protection Agency, supported the Clean Air and Clean Water Act. I worked for a presidential candidate that ended up not running against President Nixon named Edmund Muskie, who partnered with Richard Nixon on environmental legislation. So I've made my point that through the years of the H word being used by Republicans against Democrats, by Democrats against Republicans, we've reached a point in our political history where I thought it could never be worse than the hate machine that developed about both Bill and Hillary Clinton in the 90s. A implosion, which is the term for when a nuclear device blows up, all the forces meet in one concentrated energy level that detonates a nuclear bomb. That in the 90s, the combination of highly partisan environment, 24-7 cable invented in the tail end of the 90s, just when Bill Clinton was president, an independent council statute, a monstrosity that I always quote Antonin Scalia as describing, a prosecutor with unlimited money, unlimited FBI agents in search of a crime. And that extra constitutional invention, which we Democrats created, not Republicans, led to a Secretary of Labor under Ronald Reagan being driven out of Washington in disgrace because of three independent counsel investigations, never a charge brought. And then finally, this Labor Secretary named Raymond Donovan was indicted in the Bronx, New York. And after going home to New Jersey in disgrace, being prosecuted in the Bronx, New York, and the jury came in in 40 minutes. And when they were asked, what is your verdict? The jury foreman stood up and said, do we have to say not guilty? The judge said, you can say anything you want, you're the jury. And the foreman said, each of us would like to say to Mr. Donovan, you are innocent. So 12 people very dramatically said, you are innocent. And when he took the courthouse steps, he had the very famous answer to the question, are you happy, Mr. Donovan? And he said, so where do I go to get my good name back? Now, we Democrats did that to Raymond Donovan. And then Republicans did it back to Bill Clinton. Whatever mistakes Bill Clinton made from his own weaknesses and from whatever else drove him to those mistakes. The complex of scandal machinery between media, the internet, which came into play in the late 90s, 24 seven, and the independent council statute that criminalized political differences. That implosion gave us the scandal machinery that began way back, you could say between Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton, who accused each other of having an affair, and they were both right. <laughs> and they played gotcha back in 1796 when Hamilton had to fess up when agents of Thomas Jefferson leaked his affair. And then, of course, in the early 1800s, allegedly, according to biographers, Alexander ha Hamilton got his gotcha moment and he leaked the well uh, known among a small circle of people rumors about Sally Hemings. So it didn't start with President Nixon or Bill Clinton or any other president that's been bogged down in this machinery who made serious mistakes and was held accountable, but it did get worse. Didn't begin in our time, began when human beings were created with weaknesses and other human beings to take advantage and exploit those weaknesses. But where we are today, when my friend George Bush became the object of the democratic hate machine, 
I grimaced, and I began my shift in my orientation. And that's why I decided to say yes to Fox News, that I would be the Democratic voice, even if everybody thought I was on an even keel and smiled all the time. Because I thought it was important to start to convey a message that led me to a book that I wrote called Scandal, How Gotcha Politics is Destroying America. That voices on both sides learn the difference between attack and disagreement between smear and innuendo and facts. And the ability to disagree agreeably is the way this country can get back and govern. And what's going on in Washington today is so dysfunctional, so impossible to comprehend, that I have friends who are members of Congress who are afraid to be seen socially talking to members of the other party. So let me uh, conclude by telling you a true story where a momentous, inspirational moment occurred between Bill Clinton and George W. Bush. And having now experienced how moved I've been in walking through and revisiting the great life of President Nixon, I changed my ending to these remarks by wanting to tell you this true story. So it's the spring of 2004, and the hatred, H word, horrible word, towards George W. Bush for going into Iraq, for his tax cuts, and for a lot of other policies that offended liberal Democrats, policies that I did not agree with, was in such a fever that it reminded me of the worst days of the hate machine against Bill Clinton, except this time it was my side against George Bush. And having great affection and high regard for President Bush, I was very uncomfortable with the level of hate at dinner parties and conferences among Democrats. And so there came a moment when President Clinton and Mrs. Clinton were invited to the Bush White House for the unveiling of the official portrait of the president and the first lady. I was as lucky as I am standing here today. I consider myself to be privileged to have been invited here and to be able to speak to this audience. I was privileged to be invited in that room. But for a little while, before we all sat down in the East Room, sun drenched on a May beautiful day, I was very nervous because all I heard among all the Clintonistas and lots of Democratic officials from the Congress to be here for this great event of the unveiling of the official portrait of the President of the United States and the First Lady was the H word. I'm not going to sit here when he walks in the room. I, I can't stand him. I H him. And I'm thinking, this is not going to be good. It's going to embarrass the Clintons if there's hissing, booing, or anything that constitutes disrespect. And I said to my wife, this is not good. How do we get the word to President and Mrs. Clinton? They've got to calm things down in this room. Couldn't get the word to them because they were upstairs in the mansion, in the residence, I should say, with President Bush and, and Laura Bush. So we all sat down in the East Room and in walks, President Bush and Laura Bush and Hillary and Bill Clinton. And they sit in the front row, happened to be the row right in front of me. Uh, my friend Hillary turned around and waved at me and I waved back. And I wanted to whisper to her, God, I'm nervous or something, but I couldn't. President Bush took the podium. You could feel the tension in the room and he started out by looking down at the Clintons. Didn't surprise me that he started out this way. Welcome home, President Clinton and Mrs. Clinton, Senator Clinton. You brought light and energy to this house. And he went on to describe the Clinton presidency and all of its achievements. And Bill Clinton was moved. I could see him right in front of me. 
and the entire audience, when President Bush was done, stood up and gave President Bush a standing ovation. Oh my God, I thought. George Bush has proven what I've always known about him and maybe about politics, that when you transcend the hate and the polarization, there's humanity there that people were recognizing, the graciousness of President Bush. Now Bill Clinton takes the stage. And naturally, he rose to the occasion as he always does. And he spoke about how moved he was by the graciousness of the Bushes and by what President Bush had said. And then he said these words, which is really the way I would like to leave you to think about why we don't have this today. Bill Clinton said, thank you for the way you have talked to me this morning, President Bush. Wouldn't it be wonderful if instead of people using words about good or evil, they could use words about right or wrong or agree or disagree. You have proven that it is possible for two people who led this country, who disagree on many issues, to have a common purpose and a common civility. It was electric. The whole room stood up and cheered. And there's a kind of a guy thing here, which I will describe to you. So some of the women nodded their heads when I said, redundancy male ego, so now it's the guy's turn. President Clinton looked down at President Bush when the ovation was occurring. And of course, President Bush and Mrs. Bush were seated. And he kind of pointed like that to President Bush. President Bush pointed like that back. So if you ever seen basketball players do a quick, that's sort of like, you know, what they were doing. <laughs> it's a guy thing. <laughs> So let me say to you in conclusion, I feel hopeful. If I can be here after all my heritage with my dad, may his soul rest in heaven. He is smiling down at me in heaven, uh, allowing me to say wonderful things about Richard Nixon, not only because I think he would agree with the spirit of my words, but my mother's next to him giving him an elbow in the ribs. <laughs> I think that's true. So I am honored again. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for allowing me to share some of my thoughts about President Nixon, uh, President uh, Clinton, and my friend uh, Hillary Clinton, who maybe someday will look for other things to do. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Lanny. Uh, Mr. Davis has graciously agreed to answer a few questions, so uh, if I see any hands, I will come to you and ask you to uh, take the mic and, and ask them. And while you're thinking up those questions, I have one, and you mentioned it at the end there, is she or isn't she running for president? <laughs> and I have two follow-ups, okay? So I'm very proud when I'm on Fox of being the person who always answers every question directly. In my book, as you'll see, has the mantra, tell it all, tell it early, tell it yourself, about crisis management. So my answer to your question is, I won't answer your question. <laughs> <laughs> I will tell you that Hillary Clinton is the greatest friend anyone could ever have. She's funny, she's warm, she is loyal, she's there when you need her through thick and thin, and if you ever heard her laugh, you would be laughing without knowing why you're laughing. She is one of the great people I've known since law school when, as I said, her name was Rodham. If she decides to run for president, she will make a great president, the way she made a great Secretary of State, because as in law school, she worked harder than anybody I knew, and while she was working harder, she said to me, where do I go to volunteer for legal services for the poor? So that is my answer, that if she runs, she'll be a great president, a non-answer. <laughs> All right, I, I, I said I had a follow-up. So uh -oh. the follow-up <laughs> question is, who will be her vice president candidate? Uh, constitutionally, it cannot be Bill Clinton. 
the Constitution bars not only running again, but being in a position where you might become president. At least that's the interpretation. Uh, honestly, uh, it's so far in the future. I want Hillary Clinton to be happy, healthy, and to get a lot of sleep, and then we'll see what happens. Well, I have a third one. And who would the who would she like to run against? <laughs> you're tough. I'm glad you're not Sean Hannity. That's all I have to say. Oh, okay. Do you want to stand? All right. This is very superficial, but uh, what, what fraternity were you in? With Delta Kappa Epsilon. Okay. And there is a ritual of initiation at Delta Kappa Epsilon that President Bush and I share the secret. Laura Bush once asked me when I first met her, is it true that you have this certain little scar on your back? And George Bush looked at me like, if you say a word, I'll <laughs> know. We were in uh, Delta Cap Epsilon, which was the social fraternity at Yale. I was a reporter for the Yale Daily News. That's where I graduated. But all my friends were in Deke. And George Bush was the president. And he was also a member of the same residential college that I was in, Davenport College, which is a small community. 12 residential colleges at Yale. And so uh, George and a number of my friends who would have great times on Saturday nights with Vassar girls while I was not at the Deke parties convinced me I ought to get over there and get to know some Vassar girls, so I did. Thank you. Sorry, nowadays it's Vassar boys and girls, so it's not. Hi, Lanny. When you were talking about um, maybe you're at a social gathering and you hear all this hate for the other side, did you ever confront these people and say something about, hey, let's not talk that way? Or did you just kind of stand there and cringe and go away? I mean. Gosh, is that a great question? So the answer is I. What do we do in that case? The answer is I confronted in a respectful way as if somebody were to say the N word in front of me. I have been taught by my dad from a movie called Gentleman's Agreement. Gregory Peck in the late 40s won an Academy Award. And the lesson of that movie was about anti-Semitism, but it was about any bigotry, is the gentleman's agreement is to be silent in the face of bigotry, because you don't want to make uh, offensive or confrontational moments. My father said, don't you ever remain silent when bigotry or hate is expressed in your presence. That's what Gregory Peck in the book and movie, Gentleman's Agreement, teaches. And I've taught my children that. And so when I heard the hate words used about George Bush, I would say, if you're going to speak that way, I'm not going to be present. And I would draw a line. So I hope on both sides of the fence, we're able to do that with people who substitute hate words for dialogue. Okay. But thank you for that question. Mr. Davis. This is Southern California where there's not a lot of hockey players, but I want to congratulate oh, Yale thank you. University for winning the national championship. 16 C <laughs> national champion Yale. Go Eli, thank you. <laughs> Mr. Clinton. For nothing, for nothing, folks. I donated a tooth to the sport, so. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Mr. Quinn stole my question about what Hillary's gonna do, but if she doesn't run for president, what is she gonna do? She is a dedicated public servant. The honest truth is she cannot avoid doing public service. I pleaded with her when she came to my book party and I whispered, uh, thank you for coming a few weeks ago in New York. Get some rest, read a good book, watch TV and relax. And I won't tell you what she whispered back at me. It was typical Hillary, but it was good humored. I think she uh, will do something in public service. And I think politics is very hard for her to resist. But I think she knows when she ran four years ago, she was already nominated and elected before she went into the first primary. The media has a great, great desire to make contests and tear people down. I don't think she's fooled one iota by how difficult and challenging any run for the presidency would be. I think she's the best, so I'm very biased. But I think she really has to decide what she wants to do with the rest of her life. But one way or the other, uh, friends of hers, like me, have known her as long as I have, just want her to be happy. She deserves to rest. 
Uh, Mr. Davis, we have three special guests here I'd like to introduce. Oh, my and goodness. one of them is Bob Bostock, who uh, helped write an awful lot of the uh, exhibit text here at the Richard Nixon Presidential Library. And he was also uh, an, a, an assistant to President Nixon post-presidency in New Jersey. Frank Gannon, who was a White House speechwriter for the president and came to San Clemente with him to help write uh, memoirs. Dwight Chapin, who was special assistant to the president, traveled with him throughout his campaigns and uh, arranged his uh, schedule and so forth in the White House. So we're delighted to have the three of you here. And Mr. Bodstock has a question. Could I just say that I've asked for the autographs of Mr. Gannon and Mr. Chapin, who've been <laughs> legends in my mind for many years. And, 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 and I offered an autograph, and he refused. Well. <laughs> <laughs> no offense. Uh, Mr. Davis, you've identified, I think, with great clarity uh, the problem at the heart of American politics today. How Thank do you. we fix it? Oh, besides changing human nature, uh, we're going to have Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton, truly great people, being really bad. Uh, I think there's an institutional problem. That's an easy, glib answer. Until we do something about one-party districts that are gerrymandered so that people don't have to worry about going to the middle to get the votes where most people are, and they're more worried about losing primaries from the far extreme of their own party. The Republican Party today, thank you very much, Republicans, lost the Senate because they ran primaries and didn't do something about truly out of mainstream extremist candidates who won primaries. Now that happens in congressional districts so that rather than socializing with Democrats or Democrats socializing with Republicans, if you don't have to worry about a general election and you're only worried about being outflanked by your extreme, there's not gonna be an end to this vicious cycle. So that's an institutional answer. The other is we need a president who is willing to stand up to his own base, whether it's a Republican or a Democrat. And I think that right now, Barack Obama has shown me a willingness to run for history rather than for reelection. He disappointed me in his first term, sometimes pleased me greatly, but disappointed me in not standing up to the base of our party, of which I am a loyal member, on the issue of the national debt, and on not taking his own deficit reduction commission recommendations by Senator Simpson and Erskine Bowles and endorsing it. Now, for the first time, he has gone to the Republicans and said, let's fix this debt, because our children, our great-grandchildren, are paying for our credit card receipts, and that's wrong. So I'm hoping that a president can bring the country together the way that Richard Nixon looked at that sign and saw that young girl in the closing days of his campaign bring us together, Mr. President. I think only the president is the person everybody votes for. At the end of the day, it's got to be the president that lances this boil of poison in Washington and rises above it. And I hope President Obama will do that and run for history. A question from Mr. McClellan. Thank you. Thanks for coming to Yorba Linda. Um, just to make it a little bit topical with the events on Monday in Boston, I think since the last couple of days you've seen that kind of uh, 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 transcendence above kind of the fray and it's an unfortunate event that does that. But how do you, how do you communicate, at least from, from a political perspective, that same necessity to kind of transcend or be above the fray with that 24-hour news cycle? Because I think that in times of crisis, like we've seen, it does, it does the, the media does come above that fray, but on the day-to-day -day when something unfortunate doesn't happen, it, it sinks down to a left versus right 24-7. So how do you communicate and get that message through that news cycle? Well, I'm glad you mentioned the um, unfortunate but still real phenomenon that when America is attacked, when we experience tragedy, whether it was Oklahoma City or whether it was 9-11, we had a president of the United States and Bill Clinton and George Bush who stepped up to the line and rose to the occasion and brought us together. 
I think Barack Obama has that ability and has done so after Boston. It's just too bad that it takes events of serious tragedy that gets people to rise above the level of their vitriol, which is daily uh, politics. So I guess I have to return to my theme that the cable uh, culture at night, where there are food fights on the left and food fights on the right, media, which used to be fact-based, is now more opinion than fact-based, even in mainstream uh, circles, and the vicious anonymity of the internet, blogosphere, and social media, where people hide behind anonymous names, take personal attacks, and aren't held accountable. As I write about in my book, so I have to give my book, Crisis Tales, a little plug. I liken it having been finding myself in a position of being under attack to about what I believed and thought I demonstrated in my book were falsehoods, being in the middle of a swarm of bees. If there's any challenge in our culture today is what do you do when a lie is circulating on the internet and it goes viral through Twitter and through Facebook and through all of the social media and then it lives on forever in the internet echo chamber of the search engine. What do you do? I tried to come up with a metaphor in my book and I ended my book uh, with the metaphor of a swarm of bees. If you're in the middle of a swarm of bees, maybe you have honey in your hair and a beehive burst, think about it. The bees swarm around your head, what do you do? You can whack at them with, I say in the book, with truth and facts, and what happens? They just swarm faster. So we've got to address the problem of the internet exacerbating the polarization in our culture as well as some of the other leadership needs we need from our political leadership. Lanny, the thank, great Dwight Chapin. Yeah. <laughs> thank you very, very much thank for you, uh, being here this evening. Uh, and, and what, number one, I want to say it would have been great if I had had the opportunity to meet your father, number thank one. You. And number thank two, you. your reasonableness is, is, is addicting. And it's <laughs> one of the reasons my wife and I always enjoy seeing you when you're thank on, you, on television. Thank we, you. We really do. Thank you. What is the greatest most complicated crisis management situation that you have ever had to deal with? Wow. Well, there are 13 chapters in my book. <laughs> the one I found myself in the middle of on New Year's Eve day and the front page of the New York Times, where I opened up the front page of the New York Times, of course I knew it was coming, and I read this horrible story about this horrible person. And I'm thinking, oh my God, this story is really awful. This guy needs a good crisis manager. Wait a minute, that's me they're writing about. <laughs> <laughs> I'd have to say uh, that I was working with the State Department to try to get safe passage out of the Ivory Coast of someone who had lost an election and was initiating bloodshed that would have killed a lot of people. I couldn't talk publicly about it. The embassy hired me to try to find a solution. And for about 10 days, I was getting killed by this anonymous and distorted uh, attack on the internet. And then all of a sudden, the New York Times wrote a story, picked it up, and it went viral. So that's probably the worst experience, because I was surrounded by grandchildren and my children, and I was miserable at our lake house. Didn't go skiing, I was just miserable. But I would say the most difficult was the Penn State matter that I was brought into. I write about it in the end of my book by the president of Penn State, a truly great man named Rod Erickson, who inherited the presidency after the president who was uh, at the helm during the Joe Paterno Sandusky matter. And my challenge was trying to get a forum for the board of trustees to explain why they made their very anguished decision to replace this great man, Joe Paterno, who made a wrong choice, and in his own words, his own words should have done more. How to do that, and the story of how I got it done in a little conference room at Teterboro, New Jersey airport, 
with the Board of Trustees, 13 of them talking to two New York Times reporters. There wasn't a dry eye in the room, including the two reporters, and they got their story out about the difficulty of their decision. That was probably the toughest thing I ever had to do. We have time for one more question, and it'll be from Dr. Frank Gannett. Well, uh, actually, Dwight just asked my question, so I'll ask a variation of it. Uh, what are some of the other crisis tales? You mentioned one mantra, uh, get tell it early, tell it your, all and tell it yourself. Yes. Uh, are there other things? What uh, was the audience you had in mind for it? What can the average reader learn from it? Uh, and just as, a, as an author, because you've written a book and I know what that involves, some of that, that involves, I'll ask what I think of as Brian Lamb question. How do you write? How do you organize? Do you use a computer? Do you have a room in your house dedicated to it, because you're doing a lot of other things. How do you write the second of two books? I write at the kitchen table with my eight-year-old and my now 14-year-old driving me crazy. <laughs> and my favorite chapter in this book, the one I enjoyed writing, and the way I write in this book is narrative telling good stories. It's called Crisis Tales, because it's good stories. And a good way to end this uh, narrative, and I'll, I'll stay with you and we'll answer your question after is about Trent Lott when he made his mistake in the toast on Strom Thurmond. So to keep this short, I know that I'm over time here. After it was over for Trent Lott, my friend Jack Kemp, the late Jack Kemp, who somehow I get to be friends with conservative Republicans, called me and said, will you help Trent? So what I did for Trent Lott is put him together with Reverend Jesse Jackson and at the end of the conversation on the telephone, Reverend Jackson said, Senator, I forgive you, let us pray. And I'm sitting in a room with Jesse Jackson while he's praying for Trent Lott, and I'm thinking, I gotta write this. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And I come laden with gifts. Uh, <laughs> I want you to take home to what I know it must be a vast law library, but I want you to add the works of another lawyer, uh, Richard Nixon, these two leather-bound volumes of, of his memoirs. Oh, my gosh, uh, that's what I wanted. Thank you. Anyway, I'll, you knew and you didn't tell me. I'll, I'll put them down here. We'll ship them to you. I also know that in your role as a crisis consultant, that your, your, your creativity must be fertile, you're decisive, you know what to do, but there are those times when you're pressed, you don't know what to do. You say to yourself, I just simply don't have the answer for this client or this friend. So I have the answer, and it's this mug of what would Nixon do? <laughs> and so when... We thank you for your observations, your, your positive observations on Richard Nixon. We thank all of you for coming. Uh, Mr. Davis is going to be in the lobby in just a moment to sign your books. You can find them in the gift store. Thanks to all of you for coming. Good night. I can't believe you. I'm just going oh, to yeah. you. I'm going to send you. Uh, we're, I just wanted to see you later. Oh. Uh, okay.